Hey friends, I'm back again. All right, today we are going to paint six flowers. Now these six flowers are kind of uncommon, but once you know how to paint them, you are going to feel so empowered creatively. Carnations, asters, morning glories, daffodils, larkspur, and water lily. I know, when you feel comfortable painting these six blooms, you're going to feel comfortable painting anything. I promise. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you want to paint with me? Well, come on, let's go. All right, friends, here we go. I'm using Academy watercolor paper today. It's a cold press and of course the Art for Joy's Sake brush collection. I love Academy, it's affordable. You can check out how to purchase it in all the information below. And the brushes, friends, I know many of you have already received them, uh, but if you haven't and you wanna take a look, there's a link below as well. Spray that palette down. Today I'm using Holbein, and I'm gonna start with the quarter inch dagger. Just a few words about Holbein, friends. These colors are the perfect mix of classic sheer watercolor and also some pigments that are a slightly bit more opaque. I love this set. A lot of pre-mixed colors, you will enjoy this so much. We're starting off today with a carnation, friends. And let me tell you about the carnation because it gets a bad rap. If you can confidently paint a carnation, you're gonna be able to paint a ranunculus, a camellia, roses, any flower that has kind of that layered look, lots of petals, dense petals. So the carnation, is where it's at. All right, let's get going. You're gonna hold that brush with the point facing down and the curved edge facing up or down. It's totally up to you. Grab a color and start to make some wiggly marks in little clusters. And just try to think about where the center of your carnation is as you make these marks. I'm starting with a peach color and then very quickly I start adding like a raspberry tone, pinky red, whatever you got. And again, I'm using the curved edge, sometimes I'm using the point, and I'm just wiggling and waving my brush in little clusters. And what do I mean by clusters? So you don't wanna have all of your marks connected. You wanna have like two or three, up to five connected in a row, kind of all radiating from a point, but you don't wanna connect all of those clusters. The thing about a carnation is that it looks like a flower made up of ruffly clusters. And so if you connect them all together, you're gonna lose definition. Continue on, change up your color. I'm adding in some dark color right now, kind of like a burgundy and a lizard crimson. Again, use what you have. Everything is, is damp right now on this painting. So you can confidently add in strokes and make more intense marks, but knowing you're not gonna make strong detailed marks yet because everything is damp and when that pigment hits the damp paper it'll diffuse a little bit you can see here that your carnation is coming to life i am starting to use exclusively the point of my quarter inch dagger with darker color and i'm adding in some detail some linear detail radiating out from the center of the flower or the center the point where all the clustered brush strokes meet in each cluster hopefully that makes sense <laughs> All right, friends, look at this. It's really starting to come to life. You don't wanna overwork it. You saw there I used a little bit of the lifting technique where I take a clean, damp brush, add a little water to a section that I feel is overworked or too much pigment a little bit, and scoop up that color a little bit and blot it on your paper towel, and then you can come back to it as needed. Moving on to the stem. The carnation has a kind of classic little, little, um, Oh, what do I want to call it? I guess like a, an oval little shape right where the stem meets the actual flower. So you want to create that like malformed oval. That's what we're going to call it, a malformed oval. So it's kind of like you hear me talk about teardrops all the time. You're editing a teardrop shape. Well, here you're editing an oval shape and then you're continuing down from that oval to create a really thin stem. And you're just using the tip of your quarter inch dagger with a little bit of pressure and then start to go in with the press, drag, and lift technique. You know me and my press, drag, and lift. And you know what? Let's let's cut away. Let's take a look at that press, drag, and lift technique, especially if you're new here. Okay, so the way that I approach using a dagger brush of any kind, and honestly, this could apply for any brush, 
is a technique I called press, drag, and lift. And if you say it too fast, it actually comes out as press, drag, and lift, like dragon, like the beast, which is kind of funny, but it's a great way to remember it. Load up your brush and you can start, you can stroke down or you can stroke up. It doesn't matter, but you're going to press, drag for whatever amount of time, and then start to lift gradually and slowly. And that could be one leaf you make, but if you mirror that same press, drag, and lift stroke on the other side of the first stroke you made, you could just make a wider leaf. So here's the thing, you press, but how quickly you drag and for how long will determine the length of your leaf, and then how gradually or how quickly you lift will determine the shape of your leaf. So if you drag, if you go from drag to lift really quickly, you're going to get kind of an abrupt ending to your leaf and it's not going to come to a point. But if you press and then drag slowly and also lift slowly to the point where you're completely off the page, you're going to get the most beautiful, crisp, thin point on your leaf. So you can modify press, drag and lift to create fatter leaves, super skinny leaves, or what I'm about to do, really short and quick leaves. Press, drag, lift. Press, drag, lift. Press, drag, lift. So take a look at this chart and you can see how quickly I pressed for how long and then how long I dragged the brush and then when I lifted. So those arrows, the length of these arrows indicate how long I drag for. And just know when I'm dragging, I'm always gradually lifting, always. That's just how I do it. But play around with your press, your drag and your lift and see what happens. Now I'm heading in with my liner brush, the Remember Joy brush, and I'm loading up kind of that alizarin crimson, just a really dark red. And I'm going to add some linear details throughout. This is the fun part. This is the part where you're pretty happy with the basic shape of your flower that you created with those sketchy marks in the beginning and the washi marks. Those clusters of petals are looking good and convincing. And you're like, okay, I wanna add just a little something something to bring this right on home. And sometimes I will work from the outer edge of the petal into that point where all those petals converge of the cluster. Sometimes I will start at the point and work my way out towards the edge, but you just need a little bit of something. You don't need a lot. Carnations don't have a lot of obvious like linear detail in the petals. They don't have a lot of veins, but just a little bit of something can kind of exaggerate that ruffly, almost scratchy textured look of a carnation. All right. Moving on to our next flower, and you're going to be happy about this one, the asters. Now, why are you going to be happy about this one? Well, let me tell you, asters are that perfect transitional flower. Now, here's an idea of just some of the other blooms that you're going to very confidently march right into painting once you've mastered the aster. Daisies, of course, zinnias, and then just a number of generic filler flowers. All right, I'm starting with my number two round brush from the Art for Joy State collection. And we're going to sketch in a very kind of bouncy, whimsical round shape, just a very generic shape. I'm using kind of a medium purple and I'm letting it run out, reloading with a different color, kind of a bluish purple, and let the paint run out or don't reload more often if you like a stronger look or let that paint run out if you'd like to see things kind of fade a little bit. And that's it. That's how you start your aster. You could do a couple of these or you could just do a single, totally up to you. And then I'm going to get some clean water on the same number two round. And I'm going to go in right over top of those initial sketchy marks. And I'm going to do this quickly so that those sketchy marks will still kind of bleed and fade as I add water to them. And with that water, I'm going to create the shape of my petals in some of the areas in some of them, not all of them. And what does that mean? I still wanna see some of those sketchy scratchy marks that I first put down pop through. I don't want all of those marks to go away when I start adding the water. You can apply the same technique, the press, drag and lift, press, drag and lift super quick and lift quicker and drag less as you go out to create a little spray of leaves or this could certainly look like one leaf. 
and press drag and lift, press drag and lift super quick. Change your color in between each stroke if you wanna get a really varied look. And you can work from the outer edge. So basically a downstroke or remember you can do an upstroke. It's totally up to you. The technique works well either way you try it. So I'm just continuing on with the press drag and lift to create some leaves. I'm adding in different greens, starting with yellow, adding green, starting with green, adding yellow, some blues, whatever you want. But the thing about watercolor friends, I'm going to say it again. I say it all the time. Watercolor is meant for color. You're meant to just drop in different colors of the same shade of the same green, different shades of green, different shades of blue. So when you're working with one color, always remember that that is your opportunity to add a variety of that same color. Just makes your painting that much more dynamic and, and alive, right? Let me actually zoom in here and show you exactly what I mean by adding different colors at the same time in the same leaf or petal. All right, so a great way to think about this are what are the colors that are kind of next to each other in your palette? So traditionally, you're going to load a palette or receive a palette that's already made where all the greens, the blues, the reds, the yellows, they're all kind of next to each other. So think about it that way initially. Now, of course, greens, you can tie in blues, obviously. Yellows, you can tie in reds. But let's give it a look here. Let's see how this actually works. I'm still using that number two round brush and I'm press drag lift real quick with a basic green. I'm reloading with a different, ah, a blue. And then I'm reloading. Each time I put down a stroke, I'm reloading with a different color. Now you might think that just is a little crazy, a little out of control, but watch what happens as these colors, when you touch these strokes to one another, because you're creating a leaf. So you're going to connect all these different strokes, different colors. Watch what happens when the water and the pigment and a little bit of time happens. They blend, they start to mix together on the page. And instead of a leaf that's all the same color and is kind of boring, sorry friends, you've got something pretty dynamic. Same thing goes for flowers. Start with a peach, go to a soft orange, and then go to a red and then sketch it out. And look at that, so much more dynamic and interesting. So this is what I'm talking about when I say watercolor was meant to, you're, you're meant to revel in a little bit of color and a lot of color if you're me. And this is what I mean by it. Let's try one more, same round brush. And every time I load up, that brush, it's with a different green or a different blue. So good, so gorgeous. I hope you'll try it. And this just works really well when it comes to my philosophy on paint mixing, which is not a lot of paint mixing, uh, because by doing things like this, reloading your brush, letting these strokes come together on the page, different colors, different strokes, you're allowing the colors to mix on the page. It's a beautiful thing. All right, let's get back to it. All right, I've got my leaves in and now it's time to add another aster. I'm using a dark purple and just sketching it out with that number two brush. This is that sketch first, washi technique next, and then we wrap it up with the detailing. Love this technique so much. There comes the water with some color going on and I'm defining those sketchy marks by a kind of a pressing and pushing technique, but it's basically a version of press, drag, and lift. And then let's keep on going by adding a little bit more water to soften out that color and to spread the color around. And now I do feel like I need some yellow. And even though my aster is still damp, I'm gonna go ahead and scoop out some of the purple in that first aster or lift it out with a clean brush and dab on a paper towel. And then I can confidently go in not with a lot of pressure though, even though it's still damp and add some yellow right in the middle of both of these flowers. Now I add it, I'm adding yellow when these flowers are either damp, the first one, or pretty wet, the second one, knowing full well that a bit of that yellow is going to travel into the other petals, but that's okay. All right, moving on here, friends. I love this so much. Love these asters. Adding a few more leaves, same technique, changing up the colors, getting a little darker, more intense. Now it's time to bring out that liner brush. Everything has dried. I definitely have given things time to dry completely. Going in with a dark purple, working from the center out to the tips and adding in these linear marks that are going to create so much gorgeous detail. Now look, I actually went from the tip of the petal towards the center this time. So it works both ways. And don't feel like you have to use the same number of marks 
on every petal because that would get boring and repetitive. You want your asters to feel as natural as possible. So each petal, treat the detailing that you add a little bit differently. Some places I'll just make short little marks. Some places I'll add just like a sketchy petal that I add in at the end that I don't fill with color. Just a great way to keep things interesting. Keep the eye excited. Whoever's going to view this painting eventually, I like to think about that. How can I keep the viewer intrigued? How can I keep them guessing? And that kind of thought process is what really determines a lot of the decisions I make. If I'm feeling bored as I'm painting, I know my viewer is going to be bored. Just moving on, I'm going to start adding some of the same detailing in these leaves that I created. Just a dark green that I pulled right from my palette. Maybe you already have something mixed on the uh, mixing trays of your palette. Just use that. Rewet it and use that. Don't get precious about it. You just want to get something on there that's darker than what you already have so it pops a little. This liner brush, friends, is super sensitive to pressure. So the harder you press with this liner brush, the thicker the mark you're going to see. The lighter you press, I often press lightly with this brush, the more control you're actually going to feel that you have. Hear me again with this liner brush. It's got a long, long bristle. The lighter you press, the more control you're going to feel like you have over what this brush does. And I know that's kind of counterintuitive to what you would think. Friends, are you having a blast? Are you enjoying this session? Give this video a boop. I'd be so appreciative. All right, next up, oh my gosh, the morning glories. Morning glories are a little bit more like of a crazy flower. They're very unique in shape. But if you can paint a morning glory, you're going to feel really good about moving on to petunias, any type of trumpet shaped flower, yucca, and even honestly, what you do with a morning glory is going to start to inform flowers like daffodils that have that trumpet shape in the middle that can be a little tricky and challenging. Now, fair warning, this is definitely the most challenging flower we, we will have painted so far, probably on this channel. I don't say that to be alarming. I don't say that to make you nervous. I just say that to let you know, set your expectations that we're going to be using a little bit of a different technique than we have before. And you might want to try this a couple times. You might want to try this um, as many times as it takes for you to feel really comfortable with using this brush in this way. I am going to be using the three quarter inch flat wash brush from the Art for Joy Sake collection. I know you're like, wait, what? Trust me. Remember with this brush, French, you're going to be using the edges the tips, the corners, you're very rarely going to be using the whole width of this brush. And when you realize that it's in that moment that using a brush like this with this size and this presence is going to feel all, all that much less overwhelming. All right, I'm loading up my brush with a medium blue. You pick what you like. So you want kind of like 60% pigment, 40% water, somewhere in that range. You don't want super dark at this point, but you also don't want super light. And here's the thing, friends. I'm looking at this morning glory in a very specific way. And let's hop off here, zoom in, and take a look at how I'm determining the size and the look of the strokes that I am putting down on this page with this crazy brush. Okay, the thing to know about a morning glory is that the center is never at the center unless you're looking at it literally from the top down. So our morning glory is kind of centered at the bottom of the flower. And then the shape is basically made up of lines that are radiating out from the center. Now watch how I use this brush. I'm literally taking a damp wash brush, the same brush I'm gonna be using soon, and going right over top of those sections to show you how I hold the brush and how that brush can make those shapes in one or two strokes each. That's it. This beautiful, big, crazy brush can make all those strokes for you. Okay, let's do this for real. So I'm starting with my medium blue loaded up on my brush and I am thinking about where my center is down low on this flower and I'm creating these kind of casually radiating shapes from that center. While things are damp, I'm going to go ahead and add a bright pink to kind of define where that center is, letting it kind of do its thing, moving it around a little bit radiating out, but not a ton. 
And you'll notice the bottom of that flower has a pinky tone to it. So I'm going to use my brush and really exaggerate that pink tone that is kind of the trumpet, the base of the trumpet of this trumpet shaped flower. Moving that color around with a clean, damp brush. Notice how I'm using just the tip sometimes and then other times I'm using the whole width of the brush. Now I'm going in with a dirty pink brush meaning there's still pink on my brush. And I'm gonna further define these shapes, making this flower a little bit more purple now. Think about using the very edge of your brush without much pressure or the very corner of the brush without much pressure. That's how you get detail out of a wash brush. You use the very edge, the very corner without a lot of pressure. Okay, now I'm moving on to the quarter inch dagger friends because I need a little bit more control and smaller marks going to make the stem and everything is still pretty damp. I'm working down, press, drag and lift, but in a downward stroke and then press, wiggle and lift as I drag to create a few curvy leaves. Okay, now here comes some fun. The flower is still damp, so I'm grabbing some dark blue and I am going to go along the top edge here of my damp morning glory and add a little bit of contrast detailing. See how I'm changing the pressure, pressing down in some areas more than others. Now this is not an outline, friends. This is just a fun way of adding some instant shading. I'm gonna get brave. I'm gonna use a very light touch and I'm going to further define those sections of this flower that are all leading back to the center. Defining a little bit of the front of that flower with this darker blue. And all of the marks I'm making are less stressful because I'm making marks into damp paper. So if I don't like something, I can very quickly wash my brush and lift it right out and dab it away on a paper towel. All right, now I've let everything dry, which is important at this stage because we're gonna go in with our liner brush and start to add some detail. If things weren't dry at this point, you would struggle to get definition. I'm going right from the very center here out to the edge of the flower with widening strokes. And now I'm going from the edge of the flower to the center because I want you to know both can work. These lines I'm making though are not perfectly graceful. They're not perfectly arcing. They are a little bit wiggly and whimsical. And I love that. I am using very light pressure and even with my light pressure, I am using even lighter pressure to make sure that these marks don't feel heavy, don't look heavy. I want them to feel wispy and whimsical. So even let your paint run out a little bit. Coming down to the front here, this is an important part because you really want the front of this morning glory to feel like it's curving out towards you. So you've got to just get those curves right and it's all about those lines that you're creating with this liner brush stemming from the very center and arcing out. Taking my liner brush, loading it up with a bright but intense pink, use what you've got and creating some definition on that trumpet shape. And I'm going right in to create some definition now on the center and I am pressing harder, creating some dimensional marks at the center. Now these aren't gonna stay this way. I'm gonna do some lifting to get a shaded ombre effect, an ombre of kind of a dark to light, light to dark effect. But don't think that you can't use your liner for anything but thin, wispy lines. You can actually create dimensional marks with your liner brush. All right, now I'm going in with my number two round brush, friends. All right, I'm using that dark blue again. Use what you've got. You're just gonna tap at the center there very quickly, just at the base of those marks you made with the pink that defined your center. Just make a mark right at the base and it's going to make that whole center of your morning glory really pop. Now I'm getting a purple of some kind on my brush. Again, use what you've got. I'm gonna go at the very base of the petals where they meet that trumpet shape of the flower and I'm gonna add a little touch of that purple. I'm gonna rinse my brush and blend out that touch of purple eventually, but I'm gonna let it dry a little bit first. Use that same purple to further define the center. See, I'm going from the outer edge of the pink center down to the middle and just continue to define. If you wanna add more detailing, 
to really hit home that front petal curling out towards you, then by all means do it. All right, here's that water, that dampness on my brush that I'm going to put right underneath that purple and let it blend out. And you've got instant wow factor shadow. All right, wrap it up with a really fun touch. I'm taking the lightest blue I have. You might wanna mix a little bit of your favorite blue with even a little bit of white watercolor. And I am adding the final touches of linear detail. This blue acts as a highlight. It's light, it's a little creamy, and it really just makes everything pop. And it changes the color of this flower a little bit to be more of that bright morning glory blue. My inspiration image was much more purple overall. Uh, but I wanted to go a little bit more blue. And so adding this light and creamy blue everywhere, just thin, fine lines is just the perfect decision for me. You might want to go more purple. You do you. All right, grab a dark green that you love and let's add some detail to those leaves going right down the center with a light wiggly touch and then working from the outer edge into the center line to create those veins. Often I go from the center line out, but this is just another fun way to create dimension on your leaves using detailing. Okay, the next flower is gonna give you a little bit of a breather from the intensity of that morning glory. Oh my gosh, the daffodil friends. It's the perfect follow-up because you got some of that trumpet shape action going on. But let me tell you what, the daffodil, if you can master this, you're gonna be all at it with tulips, with cosmos, even with hellebore, those Lenten roses that have become so popular over the last few years. So let's dive in. This time I'm using my half inch dagger friends. This one is so fun and I'm gonna start with the tip and we're just going to make some squiggly wiggly marks. I know that's such like a professional name for it, but you're gonna sketch basically the center of this daffodil with your dagger. And then I'm gonna make a little off center circle, sketchy, not perfect. And then a little water on my brush and I'm going to wash it all together, still preserving some of those sketch lines. I don't want them to disappear completely. I even have, I think, a little bit of yellow on my brush from something else I had done before, but it actually works beautifully. Happy, happy accident. I love it, I love it so much, so good. Go ahead, right in the center with a, your favorite green. You pick what you love. Don't fill it in perfectly. That's just my suggestion for a more whimsical and natural looking flower. Now I'm gonna use this curved edge, loading up with some yellow. And yes, my center is still wet. So just know that if you touch down into the center, you are going to get a little bit of that orange into your daffodil petals, which is just fine. Now, see what I did? I sketched with the edge, the curved edge of this dagger brush, and I just created two arc shapes that met in the middle. And now I'm going in with the tip and filling in just with a little bit of water on my brush, pulling that color from those two arc shapes that I made into the center. And here we go. As you get more confident with these brushes, you're gonna find ways of making these same exact marks, but in ways that make sense and feel good to you. So it's all good to copy me for as long as you feel you need to. And there we go, two arcs and then fill it in in the middle. I changed up the color on my brush there a little bit using different yellows as I went, because you know how I feel about different yellows, different colors as we move along. Now I'm going in with the tip of my same dagger, the half inch, and I'm adding little notchy strokes of color. And I, I say notchy because I'm like notching out the shape with two simple strokes. And then I'm going ahead with a damp, clean brush and filling them in. And friends, literally like your daffodil is almost there. I mean, look at this, look at what you've done. Holy cow. We haven't done it yet today during this session, but I really hope that you've beaten me to the punch. Have you told yourself something amazing about this painting that you're working on? If you haven't, um, it's time, you're overdue. I'm really loving how the yellows here aren't feeling the same. They're not feeling boring. I'm gonna pat myself on the back about that because I sometimes for me, yellows can get kind of boring 
and they are not boring here right now. Super excited about it. Okay, we're gonna use the number two round for detailing this time, not the liner brush right away. I want a little bit of a thicker mark. To me, daffodils feel thicker in general. They just have a stronger presence. And so I'm working from the middle out. I'm using an orange. If that feels too strong to you, then mix a little more yellow with an orange and just keep going around, going around. And just make sure that those marks don't look exactly the same on each petal. Do what I did there. Just start working from the outside edge of the petal in. I'm gonna define some of the centers of these daffodil petals. They look like they almost have a line going down the center. So I added the line and then just blended out with clean water from the line outwards. Lovely. You can do that in a couple spots. Now go ahead with your quarter inch dagger and let's make some leaves. I'm just gonna make a simple stem. It's gonna run right off my paper. One green to start and then another green to define. And let's get a leaf in here, press, drag and lift. You're gonna be carving this leaf kind of around your daffodil. So you're gonna be using the tip of your brush more. So gorgeous, I love it so much. All right, friends, you did it. The daffodil, I told you, the daffodil was gonna be a definite break and breather from that crazy morning glory. All right, let's move on to our next flower. If you're new here and you haven't subscribed to the channel, I'm just gonna ask you to do it right now. Do yourself a favor. I'm not perfect, friends, but we have a good time here. We meet up twice a week and you don't wanna miss a thing. Next up, we have Larkspur. And you're probably like, wait, okay, you've really gone off the deep end, Christy. This is such a strange flower. But let me tell you what, it's kind of like the aster. Once you can master larkspur, which is basically a tall stem with multiple flowers placed throughout the stem, you're going to be on it with delphinium, hydrangea, milkweed, vines of any kind. And yes, you guessed it, filler flowers. Oh yeah, let's do this. I'm using the cat's tongue, friends. And uh, yeah, I know the cat's tongue. It's the watercolor curious brush. It's got a horrible normal name, but I've given it a lovely new name. So um, let's move on from, you know, that crazy name of the brush. So yeah. Ugh. Anyway, we're going to start off with a nice blue. We're going to press and wiggle and lift really quickly. That's one petal. We're going to do it again and again. We're going to change the angle of the stroke we make. We're going to change the angle of how we hold this brush. Now this brush is weird. It takes a little getting used to. These bristles in general feel stiffer than any of the other brushes in my collection, um, but they work beautifully for making defined shapes. Right there, you can make one petal with two strokes. You can make one petal with one quick stroke and curve it upwards. And we're just gonna keep doing that. We're gonna create a few of these Larkspur blooms. Change up your blue as you go. You know how I feel about this. Come out straight in some of your petals. Make some of your petals really thin. Make some of them a lot thicker. Make some of them really short and quick like that one or really curve out your brush as you do the drag part of that technique. Some of your petals could just be a little bump, a little tap, let your paint run out, but each of these blooms should definitely look different from one another. That is the name of the game, to make them feel natural and like you are painting some semblance of realism. All right, friends, grab your liner brush and we're gonna make this stem, fill it with your green, load up the favorite green of yours, it doesn't matter what it is, and stroke at an angle from the bottom up. And then you want to create shorter stems connecting your Larkspur blooms to that main stem. Make a couple more stems curving out. Some of them connect to existing flowers, some of them won't and then create some leaves coming out from the base of some of your blooms, not all. Use your favorite greens here, friends, and like I said before, change up those greens as you go. It's a lovely thing. Now load up your brush with a darker blue. We're still using that liner brush and we're gonna start to add some detailing to these petals. And you know the drill, follow the contour and the curve of your petal. All right, changing the angle up so you can see better. I've let these dry a little bit, but they're not completely dry. And I'm gonna to start to 
add more detailing. If you're adding detailing into a damp area, it's going to diffuse and not be as obvious. These are drier and look at that. Boom. When you press harder, you're going to get a thicker mark. When you press lighter, you're going to get a thinner mark. Just keep that in mind as you work. You can reshape your petals that you put down earlier by creating line work that goes outside of the lines. I'm all about going outside of the lines here, friends. And just working our way down through the petals, keeping it real, keeping it natural. And that means making sure every petal has its own personality as you add the detail. Now we can start adding more definition. Oh, don't worry about that little drop of water. Turn it into a leaf. Adding more definition to the stem, adding some thicker leaves coming out. And I'm doing this all with the liner brush. Yes, you can use it for more than just thin lines. Going in with my number two with a dark, dark, dark indigo blue. Don't use a black necessarily, but if that's what you've got, go ahead and use it. I just like to mix up a dark color made from a lot of different colors. And I'm just dabbing in the center to define the center of each of these blooms. Add a few more leaves. If you feel like you need them, go back to the liner or you could use your number two brush to add some leaves coming out from the Larkspur stem. Now, the thing is, I love the liner brush for these very long, undulating, kind of twisty, whimsical leaves. They aren't really bold visually in terms of their shape. They're a little bit more, oh gosh, what's the best way? I don't know, the, the leaves almost look like they're wiggling. They're twisting and curling and the liner brush does a gorgeous job of them. So you might be wondering, what in the world does she mean by follow the contour of the petal with the liner brush? Let's zoom in and take a better look. Okay, so follow the contour. Think about like a topographical map that has all those lines that follow the contour of the land. It's kind of the same thing. So I have a simple petaled flower here and I am literally following the shape of the petal that I've already painted with linear detail lines. So follow the curve, if you will. And maybe that's a better way to describe it. But you're basically going to take your brush and you're going to recreate the angle that you use to create the initial stroke, the initial mark, but you're gonna do it with a very thin, whimsical, graceful line. And that is basically what I mean by follow the contour of your flower. And you can also, like I just did, go outside of the lines with that same contour shape, follow that same contour of your original petal, but go outside the lines and that will give you even more flexibility to edit the shape of your flower as you paint. It's a lovely technique and once you get the hang of it, which won't take too long, oh my gosh, a whole new world is gonna open up to you. All right, let's get back to it. All right, up next we have the water lily and this is the last one, friends. I know, I know you're sad. I am too, but this is a good one. So if you master the water lily, you're gonna be all over the peonies, the roses, dahlias, anything that has those very distinctly shaped petals that overlap each other in that very kind of challenging way at times. So let's get into it. I'm using the quarter inch dagger and I'm going to sketch in the yellow center. I often start my flowers with the centers. It just seems to ground the whole painting for me. And this is sketchy. I am literally just creating bouncy little shapes that move along the center of this flower. I am not trying to define anything yet. Moving right into those petals, still very sketchy with my technique here. I'm using a peach and I'm just going along and letting these pointed petals weave in and out of one another. Some of them are going to look like they're behind another petal and some are going to look like they're curving around and to the side. Some are going to be on top of your flower center and then some, the most challenging ones admittedly, are going to be the ones very much up front. And for those up front petals, I'm making little tiny squat triangles, so to speak. I know you're like, wait, what? A squat triangle? You know what I mean. I talk a lot about teardrops. The teardrop shape is such a versatile one, and it's a shape that you can think about often when you're trying to figure out how to make your marks for different flower petals. Let me show you. Okay, so here's a look at what I mean. When you're creating leaves and petals, start with a teardrop shape. Now, you can just 
imagine a teardrop shape and work from there. Or you literally could lightly sketch out with a pencil or with your brush, like we're doing that sketchy technique with your brush, a classic teardrop shape. As you're gonna see here, the pink shaded areas are more of that classic teardrop shape. But then look how I've modified the base of the teardrop and the point of the teardrop to create entirely different shapes. So I think this is a good way to think about things when you're starting to build flowers like the water lily, like peonies, like dahlias and so on that have these really defined petals that are all very different from one another, but they're not so different from one another. And it can be hard in your head to figure out how do I make these shapes? Take a teardrop modify it, make it longer, make it wider, make the edges not smooth, make it have a blunt tip instead of a pointed tip, make the base more pointed than it is curved. There's so many things you could do. So hopefully I just blew your mind a little bit with my whole teardrop scenario. Enjoy, but let's get back to this bloom. So just keep sketching out your water lily and building it out. And it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to necessarily, I mean, look exactly like the inspiration photo. I think you get that about me. I'm not looking to recreate nature. I'm trying to put my own spin on it. So it's all good. Okay, so I'm going in with a little bit of yellow on my brush and a little bit of peach. And I'm kind of now filling in adding some really strong coral colors. I'm filling in some of those sketched areas. And that's kind of the name of the game. Remember our technique trifecta in this session is sketchy, washy strokes, and then detail strokes. And I'm following along with that right now pretty strictly. I started super sketchy and now I'm going in and washing in some color to give all that sketchiness some structure. Now, I feel like I visually need a little bit of grounding. I need to be grounded right now. And what that means for me, you've heard me say it, paint in the way that keeps you motivated. Right now, friends, I need a lily pad. I need it. I need this lily pad to feel good about this painting. So I'm going to put it in. I'm still using my quarter inch dagger, but I am bringing in all different colors, friends, all different colors, and just create that big sloppy circle around the one side, the right side for me, the edge of your water lily, and just keep filling in, filling in, defining and defining. Now at this point in your leaf, you're wet and wet. So any color that you add or wet on wet, I use those two acronyms interchangeably. Anyway, so any color you add is just going to explode and blend into the next. Going back into the flower, and I'm starting just now to use the tip of my dagger to add some definition in certain areas. I'm continuing to add that bright coral color. Coral, if you don't have one pre-mixed, it's basically a pink and a little bit of orange. That's your coral. And now friends, it is time. You've been waiting. The liner brush is coming out and I'm going in with a coral color, but I don't have a ton of coral on my brush. I have more water than I do coral so that it's not so strong when I add these linear details. And I'm going from the center where the base of the petal meets the middle of the flower out. That just feels like the right move to make at this point in the painting and the right move to make to give the look I'm after. So you're just gonna keep going around this flower, friends, adding in linear detail. You can certainly start from the tip of the petal and work your way out. It's totally up to you at this point. Change up your color though so that all of your linear detail is not the same color for a more natural look. You can even get a little sketchy, add some extra petals at this point, especially at the front where you feel, you may feel like you need a little more definition at the front of this flower where those petals seem shorter, like they're coming at you. So you might wanna add some of that in in a sketchy way. I did a little bit of outlining here just in one area. I thought it was kind of fun and interesting. I wasn't loving the detailing on that front big petal, so I'm softening it with a little bit of a wash. And now I just feel like I need a little definition in my lily pad, so I'm going for it with my liner brush. Oh yeah, how fun is this? Getting even more sketchy. As I go, I'm getting bolder with my linear details, and that coral is getting stronger. So more coral on the brush, less water. Oh friends, this has been such a blast. Look at these blooms. You have a garden 
of opportunity here. I know, I know, I am so cheesy, but I love it. I can't help myself. Literally, you've painted these six flowers. I don't care how long it's taken you. I don't care if you've done one a day or one a month, but you've done it now. You have a garden of opportunity. So I want you to start venturing out. I want you to start thinking about the other flowers that you are now that much more ready to paint. I hope you've enjoyed our time together, friends. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you love. Let me know what questions you have. I answer all of your questions. Happy painting, friends. <laughs>